The views and opinions of this program are those of the host guests and callers. There is substantial risk of loss in trading futures and options, which you should carefully consider prior to trading. Today's episode of Market Talk is brought to you by Growmark FS. Keeping up with the latest in ag is a challenge, to say the least, but there are experts nearby ready to help. You'll find them at your local FS. You can trust them to bring you customized agronomic, grain, and energy solutions bored of the latest thinking. That's because FS specialists receive continuous training that keeps them current on the latest trends, practices, and technologies. So you'll get local expertise that's both exceptional and up-to-date. Visit FSSystem.com to learn how FS is bringing you what's next. Well, as we take a look at Thursday's market trade action compared to uh, the rest of the week so far, fairly quiet day in the grain and livestock trade as many folks getting geared up for Friday's big USDA reports and the end of the month of June. Here to talk about things with us, we welcome in our good friend Brian Doherty, Senior Market Advisor at Total Farm Marketing. Brian, always uh, great to talk with you, and I know as we are uh, going on air here to talk, we were just mentioning this before we uh, got back on here, is uh, some pretty nasty looking weather going through parts of the Corn Belt, mainly Illinois, Indiana, and uh, hopefully folks are staying safe around that neck of the woods. I know we, we needed rain in these areas, but we didn't necessarily need the severe weather with it as well, Brian. Yeah, that uh, our prayers and thoughts. It's always scary uh, when you see some of these wind temperatures that have been recorded, ground wind 60, 80 miles an hour, maybe more. Yeah. Uh, always, uh, always concerning. We just don't like to see that. And uh, yeah, the rain, uh, uh, USDA um, reports tomorrow and then of course, 4th of July, but big, big is just, you know, moisture and rain. The forecast began to flip kind of consistently more toward the, I don't want to say Friday, but the, the weekend, there was some, you know, nice rains that people picked up in parts, but the, um, the forecasts all week have continued to point to really just more and more moisture in the Midwest mm -hmm. yesterday and the prior day, six to 10 day forecast had the entire nation above normal and rainfall. So all of a sudden can't buy a rain, be careful what you wish for. Uh, talking to a farmer in Kansas today, they were dry forever now having trouble getting their wheat harvested due to wet conditions. Yeah. And you think about this rain uh, in the forecast or the rain that has fallen in some areas. And to me, that seems like the, the big number one catalyst as to uh, why we've taken a lot of premium out of this grain market here this week, Brian, just traders, uh, kind of the old saying, taking money off the floor, taking it out of the trading pit, so to speak, and just moving basically all this weather premium out of the grain markets. Right. And you had some really nice, uh, nice technical recoveries. We talked for a few weeks about like these inverted head and shoulders formation on corn. And they not only exceeded that, but went a little bit further. Same thing in wheat. Beautiful inverted head and shoulders formation up to a full inch band, 200 day moving average. And, and that market put in a hook reversal. But like corn, you know, we closed on a Thursday, just right at the high of the day. Strong gains. And Friday, we were off a little bit come back this week and uh, t to your kind of point it's been just a, a battering ram uh on the on the bear side and little little room for the bulls to breathe um i often am up early and catch the markets and you'll see that overnight starts maybe steady or mixed and uh, by early morning you're down five to ten already and then and it's just it's already on its way and uh, today stabilized fairly well uh Nice recovery for parts of the day, but couldn't hang on and finish toward the low end of the day in corn. Soybeans are going to finish mixed. Wheat down a little bit, but the corn market is really taking the brunt of this hit on, on forecasted rain. And, and it, you know, now it needs to show itself. Yes, and now it definitely needs to show itself. I, I'm not going to say that we've become oversold in these markets I, I don't know if that's the case uh, maybe maybe you'll disagree with me there brian but just in general ahead of these big usda reports on friday i, I wonder if maybe with all of this bearishness in the grains if we happen to get a slightly bearish usda surprise i i, I wonder if this market really goes down much more if we maybe factored some of that in we we may well have uh, but if i look at the charts if you you know if the bears want to sort of point to something they can point to a chart that saw f on December corn of 590, uh, uh, 491 and three quarters low 
Uh, so we, we still have uh, 28, nine, you know, almost 40 cents to go if, if, you, if that's your next target. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm challenged with 15% of the crop rate at Port, a very poor to really, you know, pull my eggs in one basket and be bearish right at the moment. We need rain and we need more rain. Any time the rains, we need good crop conditions to, to surface, um, crop ratings. Don't pay, you know, my, I, always, I always tell my customers, don't pay too close attention to those in June because usually the crop is either, it looks good and it's green, the ratings are high, or it starts getting dry and the ratings drop off pretty quick and then a rain can recover that. With 15% rate of poor to very poor, that's a pretty significant number in corn. Tomorrow, yes, I, I think that was the other wet rag over the market, the realization that uh, yesterday all of a sudden it's like, well, we got these reports out. Nobody's looking for friendly reports. I just, you know, without selling corn overseas, and today confirmed another week of poor sales. Uh, that's a challenge. So we, we, you know, the basis levels all year, maybe have told us that the stocks aren't quite as tight or the crop was overestimated last January in the last report. Um, and I, I'm in that camp. I, you know, they, they reduced acres and raised yield, but I don't think the crop was ever quite that big. But that being said, uh, tomorrow's numbers probably don't have a bullish tone to them. Um, in acreage, uh, 92 came out in March. Um, we thought probably, you know, as we hit it toward the latter part of May, that'd be 91. But it looked like a lot of the Dakota guys really pushed it. And so we're not so sure that's going to be under 91. It might be 91 and a half. Mm-hmm. Well, and you mentioned export sales and obviously demand, and, and we've talked about this demand just being, you know, rather, rather yucky for, for lack of a better term. And, uh, you know, that's something that I, I, we just, I have to say it again, we can't lose sight of our lack of demand in this volatile weather market right now, Brian. Yeah. It, it, it really surprises me. It's like the, the world just went absent. Um, but you've got this, uh, and I saw a word today, it kind of sums ar- summarizes it pretty good. You've got this gigantic safrina crop coming. Um, we haven't talked much about it for a long time because there isn't much to talk about when there's nothing to talk about. And that is, there's no adversity to that crop coming out of Brazil. It's, it's going to be large. Um, and it's offered onto the world market cheaper than the U.S. corn is. And so the the lack of exports would suggest end users have the comfort zone maybe, or the ability to wait until this Brazilian corn is available rather than in the past, maybe have to chase U S corn into weather scares in the U S. Uh, so they didn't, it didn't seem to chase it here the last several weeks or last several months. So uh, just a really tough, tough export market, whether that's, you can't really put your finger on it, but mm-hmm. whether it's you know communication with the administration or whether it's just Brazil or a combination of all of the above, but the reality is 5.5 million bushels old crop and disturbingly not 4.9 and new crop are, are not good numbers. You mentioned you talked to that farmer in Kansas. They've had some trouble getting wheat harvest done there. And I know in the case of the wheat markets, obviously we're still – you know, fairly, uh, fairly expensive compared to uh, the world market. But I, I feel like usually around this time of year during that hard red uh, winter harvest is when we might see a little bit of activity, a little bit of demand for U.S. wheats. But uh, uh, there, too, just not really seeing that this year, Brian. No, it's uh, and today's number was five point seven million. So when you just common sense wise, you know, you, you want to see something 10. 20 million in wheat, 15 million. You want to see numbers like that or higher in beans and corn. You really want to see 30 to 50 million, you know, consistently. If you think about it, if we're going to sell 1.5 billion, you have to average 30 million a week. If we're going to sell 2 billion, you have to average more than 30 million a week. So, mm-hmm. so those numbers, uh, yeah, discouraging, disappointing. Um, and that's what's in the marketplace right now. So you can even tell in my tone, inability to wheat to break to the top side, nice recovery, not a break to the top side. Um, Troubles getting some harvested, obviously. We've talked about that, not really providing the key support mechanism that we want there. So it's just, you know, where do we go from here? And first we got to get the reports out of the way, then get the 4th of July weekend out of the way, and then kind of get a fresh perspective on what weather looks like for corn and soybeans 
and then we'll get a better perspective too on what the wheat crop, you know, another week from now, what the yield numbers really look like. We're having a conversation here today with Brian Doherty with Total Farm Marketing. Brian, let's move over to the protein sector. Cattle trade, uh, a fairly decent day in cattle once again Thursday. Feeders uh, picking up a little bit of steam late in the session as well. Um, I know uh, keeping an eye on cash country here this week, the trade uh, seemingly reacting and moving past that cattle on feed report from last Friday. Uh, what's your thoughts on that cattle trade right now, Brian? You know, the, the futures market, well, well, two, two things. One, the, on the, in the futures market, we've got this big, big bearish reversal in charts that still loom from a, a couple of weeks back. So the market has that sort of technical fight in front of us, in front of it to, to break through there. Um, you know, when I look at this 328 or so in the choice and select cuts uh, 298, it tells us that feedlots are current. There's a pretty good spread there. So... So, and you see that. Otherwise, you'll see those narrow in if, if the cattle get a little heavier. Um, and with uh, with the surge of corn prices last week, that might have something to do with, you know, again, keeping relatively current. Um, I You know, the demand continues to underpin the market. It, it appears, though, and I go to stick my neck out here, that it's it's starting to show some cracks in the lining. We've got the reversal on the charts. And then you've got the likelihood of a growing uh, probability, likelihood of growing, growing probability of a um, increase in interest rates. Uh, Powell mm -hmm. continues to sort of hint at that. Europe is going to raise their rates. So again, it's kind of inflationary concern or, you know, from my perspective, you know, the consumer just doesn't have that many more dollars to be stretched around. In theory, two thirds of the country is living paycheck to paycheck. So, uh, I, I worry about the demand. Still want to be friendly from the supply side. I can still look out to next April and talk about two hundred dollar cattle. I can talk about if you're chasing this feeder market, what you need to get out of these cattle, and and that's kind of the bullish scenario. I just worry more about the economic side of it. How about in the hog market? I was uh, kind of trying to stall a little bit here as I tried to pull up the quarterly hogs and pigs numbers, but it feels like just some spread trading in the hog market uh, ahead of uh, those numbers out from USDA on Thursday afternoon. Yeah, on the day you had some bull spreading, no doubt. You had some strength in the front months, uh, which is, uh, you know, I think maybe a good uh, uh, a, a good sign that that the um, the cash market's on the rise. Summer prices are going to hold on the board there, and that we can we can push some more out of the cash into index. And uh, I haven't checked the hogs and pigs report either, but I don't know if it'll show up on this report. But if it doesn't, it'll show up on next. But we are going to see herd liquidation, hog liquidation, sow liquidation, and mm -hmm. that just that filters back into everything herd wise, whether it be farrowing intentions and and beyond. There is little reason to think that there should be any herd expansion in the hog industry. So, with that, well, the bulls, the bulls might or the bears might argue, well, the, that's not really true because you had pr uh, good summer months values to hedge into. Um, I'm not necessarily convinced that's that's the only factor. It's the current cash market that's really been poor compared to the herd market. So, and yeah. then higher higher grain prices this past year. So, so I think we're going to see some some overall support in the hog complex. I think those back months are undervalued. I'm just getting these numbers in front of me right now, Brian, and uh, the report, all hogs and pigs on June 1st, 72.4 million head up slightly from last year, but down 1% from March. And I know some folks will be watching those farrowing intentions and it looks like uh, the June, August quarter down 4% from the actual mm -hmm. far uh, farrowings from one year earlier. So that's just a couple of those numbers real quick. But again, it doesn't feel like uh, my glance at that. Not many surprises from what was expected, Brian. Probably not from expected, but still, I think I think what the takeaway in this is it doesn't look like we're seeing some wholesale expansion. So if you're not, yep. or it's a cheap product, I, I still think that, that you've got demand cycling more into the pork values, poultry values, and a lot of the beef values. Dairy market just uh, doesn't seem like we can catch a break over there, Brian. Nope, same same story, different week. Um, oversupply, too many cows. Uh, the market can't find the demand sector. Um, had some really interesting conversation with dairy producers this week, and what they're hearing, or if they're hearing anything to the grapevine. 
um, and from the retail sector or processors or plants. And, you know, are they going to come down and, you know, with, with the futures price coming down and then the cash coming down, are they going to come down and flip it into the, in the consumer cycle? Uh, they will. It's always slow, though. So um, I think we're, we're getting there. And you and I have talked about this. Uh, my view of the dairy market is that it will continue to have um, a tough road in front of it until it gets a bit of evidence that that the dairy producers are doing something to slow down production because demand is very slow in responding to, to a sell-off in prices, but the production side can respond a lot quicker. Those are monthly paychecks. Brian, great thoughts as always. Before we let you go, anything final you want to share or reiterate for folks today? Well, I, th I think a couple of things. You know, um, it, it, this isn't, I, I don't want to be lecturing here, but last week and then this week in particular, again, proved the value of getting some wish orders or price orders above the market. I've heard people say, oh, you know, if I say put a put your order at $6 in corn, well, it, you know, I won't get there. Or, or they'll say, well, I'll watch it when it gets there. This last week, it got there, went through it, and you're happy for a day or two. You didn't do anything, and now you're just feeling miserable. So the idea of putting price or what's called limit orders above the market, get them in place, get some sales picked up on rallies. Never had anybody you know, come to me and say, you know what, I think I'm going broke on selling these rallies. It just is things you don't hear. Um, you may give us some opportunity, but it's things you don't hear. Well, Brian, if folks want to reach out to you, get some advice there at Total Farm Marketing, I know a few different ways to get in touch with you. How can they get a hold of you? I would love a phone call, 800-334-9779. That would be uh, request number one. Um, otherwise, Brian with a Y at TotalFarmMarketing.com. Shoot me an email. Happy to answer your questions. Or uh, visit our website, TotalFarmMarketing.com. A lot of good resources there. Always appreciate the time and uh, have a safe and happy 4th of July. I will talk to you after the holiday. Brian Doherty with Total Farm Marketing. Thanks for joining us here today. Have a good one. We'll talk to you soon. Awesome. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. That's going to do it for Market Talk today. Find us online, markettalkag.com. I'm Jesse Allen. Have a great afternoon.